My name is Ethel Dreda Nachimuli Mpungu. I'm a psychiatrist and an associate professor of psychiatry at Makere University. World AIDS Day is commemorated on the 1st of December. That's when we remember you know, all people who have lost their lives to HIV AIDS and we commit to ending this epidemic. Uh, my research over the last 20 years has focused on the mental health of persons living with HIV AIDS. 20 years ago, as a young medical officer, I was recruited to work in a mental hospital, Uganda's only psychiatric hospital. And that's where I started to see uh, patients who were physically ill and also mentally ill. It was a new experience for me. I had not seen this kind of presentation when I was a medical student. So when I looked closely and started uh, reading about my patients, I realized these patients had HIV AIDS. And at the same time, they had uh, severe mental disorders and that's why they were coming in a mental hospital. So I asked myself, how is this possible? How does this start? How does this happen? I looked for information about HIV and mental health and I couldn't find any. I realized, oh my God, we don't know anything about these patients. How are we going to help them? And it is, it is at that moment that I made a decision to do research in HIV and mental health and you know, get to the root of this problem. Why were HIV patients coming to a mental hospital? It was a eureka moment for me. I, would, I had always wanted to do something unique for medicine, to make a unique contribution. And I was like, eureka, I have found what I want to do. And so my research began. My research really was to determine why are HIV positive patients coming to a mental hospital. And what we discovered was that in the HIV treatment centers, there was no mental health care at all. There was no screening, for common mental health problems, there was no treatment, and it's only when patients had overt symptoms, someone committed suicide or someone was psychotic and they were throwing stones, that's when people would wake up and say, refer to the mental hospital. That was the only treatment, refer to the mental health hospital. I realized that we actually needed mental health care in the HIV treatment centers, and these were mushrooming all over the country because there was a well-funded program for HIV care. So I asked myself, why isn't this well-funded HIV program taking care of the mental health of persons living with HIV AIDS? So that's when I realized that they, there had to be screening of these patients at the health centers to, to identify um, the, the common mental health problems in their early stages, you know, the, the, the mild depression, the anxiety, so that we could arrest it there and then. And so it would prevent people from progressing to the severe mental disorders, to the complications like suicide that were bringing them in the mental hospital. You know how the research world works. You have to provide the evidence that this is a problem. So that's when we began uh, the research journey, writing grant applications to determine the burden of common mental health problems in persons living with HIV AIDS. And by the time I was doing this research, uh, the research in the developing countries, the, the developed countries was, had already taken off. They had already documented that persons with HIV AIDS are more likely to suffer from depression. Depression was the commonest uh, mental health problem in persons living with HIV AIDS. It was known and we were now also seeing it in our patients in, in Africa, in, in Uganda. So we needed to document this evidence and then use this evidence to lobby for interventions for depression. So that is the 20 year journey of, of uh, research. When I did my PhD, I now focused on depression, documenting depression in the health centers, in the rural communities, you know, showing that there was no screening and we needed to screen people so that we can intervene early. And uh, we also showed that this depression was affecting adherence to antiretroviral therapy. So people were being given free treatments. They're very expensive. But there was a section of people, 30%, which is one in three, they were being affected by this depression and it was interfering 
with their adherence to treatment. So they were having very poor treatment outcomes. They remained sick. They uh, developed drug resistance to the drugs, to the antiretroviral therapy. So that's not, it wasn't helping um, the situation. So we had to intervene. Now, according to the World Health Organization, the first line treatment for depression is psychotherapy. We did not have culturally appropriate psychotherapy. You know, psychotherapy models had been brought in from the Western world, but they were not working as good. For example, you know, one model only worked for women. And then they said, okay, so let's treat depression in women. And we forgot about the men. But society is both men and women, you know? Men need to be well for the women to be well. So it, it, it really bothered me, but that's the gap I saw that look, we don't have psychotherapy that, that men can come to. So why don't we develop that? So that is how I got a bold idea. And so the journey started to develop group support psychotherapy, which we designed in such a way that it was culturally appropriate. Uh, we designed it with the input of the community. They told us what they wanted a group therapy to look like. We listened, we put in, um, ingredients, for lack of a better word, that could address their needs like um, poverty, uh, you know, like stigma, you know, there are certain things that are unique to the African context, the social determinants of diseases, the gender-based violence, the stigma, the poverty that drive this depression. So our therapy has to specifically address those things. So that's how we develop group support psychotherapy to address not just the symptoms, but also the social determinants of this depression. And then we evaluated it. You know, does this work? Does it not work? And we have been pleasantly surprised that our intervention, our culturally appropriate intervention was so highly effective against depression, not only depression, it reduced alcohol use, it reduced the stigma, it improved income generation. So now we're at the stage of really analyzing this data and, and finding out what is the mechanism of action. And the results are so interesting. Treating depression, we have found, is part and parcel of treating HIV. You know, this intervention had to reduce depression first. Then people get motivated to take their medication. So it improves adherence and then people had a boost in their virus suppression. That is the mechanism we have discovered. So which shows that when you treat the mind, you can influence the physiology, the body. And that makes mental health treatment part and parcel of physical treatment. Like in the case of HIV, it's no longer an option. We have to treat depression if we are going to treat the HIV. So for us, for me, that's a groundbreaking discovery. We're discovering more from this data. For example, depression heals through stigma reduction and income generation. You know, when you combine those two, people um, adopt a, a positive identity of themselves. They are better able to participate in income generating activities after they've acquired the skills that we give. And all this drives depression down. So <laughs> it's, it's been a very exciting 10 years for me, uh, working with MQ, with MQ supporting this research, because for, you know, we have produced groundbreaking results. Uh, some of these we have published. Our last paper was the one showing the, the mind-body connection, the depression treatment being connected to adherence and virus suppression. I have more publications coming up that are going to show that depression reduces through stigma reduction and income generation. Depression also reduces through social connection and positive increase in positive coping skills. We have all this data and we're going to bring it to the world. And my prayer is that really, that we use this data to change lives. You know, the things we have discovered are very simple. They're very, <laughs> they're not expensive, they're very cheap. So why don't we take them to the people? and prevent mental illness. You know, we, we can't afford to wait to break down because we don't have the money to treat full-blown mental disorders. We don't. 
So we need these early interventions. We need to go into communities early. We need to go into learning institutions. We need to teach mental health, how to protect our mental health to prevent mental disorders so that we can thrive, we can develop our communities, we can work, you know, all this, you know, the, all the so many problems that we see would be, we would solve them if we took care of our mental health. Without research, it's just guesswork. <laughs>